All right. Come on, get this. Get that. Hey, everyone, how are you? Thank you for coming out. All right. All right, first, I would like to uh, thank you all for attending the uh, Global Hospitality Leadership's first speaker series of 2018. The faculty, staff, students of SES, as well as GHL, definitely appreciate you spending your time. So thank you so much for coming. And today, we have the Chef Rockman, Rock Harper, coming to speak to us today about cultural appropriation. And a lot of times we generally go into a long bio of you, but we're going to kind of go down your life um, in an exploratory way. And um, you're going to lead us with that. So Chef Rock, welcome. Thank you. Thanks. And, Thanks uh, for having me. I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about your, yourself, your journey. Oh my goodness. That could take, uh, <laughs> I can't stay focused sometimes, so that could take a little too long. Um, well, thank you all for being here as well. I really appreciate it. I, you know, I started cooking when I was, I guess, 10 or 12 years old, loved doing it, and uh, watched my grandmother and uh, just sort of got a, took a home ec class in eighth grade, Mrs. Hill, sweet little Southern lady, showed me how to make lasagna and taught me how to uh, sew together an outfit as well. And this, the sewing part didn't stick, but the, uh, the cooking did. I couldn't believe that I made something like right. that. So I uh, always wanted to go to culinary school. My mother said I was going to college. Uh, so I uh, went to culinary school, had a great time in high school, uh, graduated and, and did a couple of things. Um, I went to Johnson & Wales University, uh, shout out to Jay Wu. Um, <laughs> and uh, of course, I worked at B. Smith's. I don't know if you all remember that restaurant in Union Station for many years. I was there for about nine years. Decided that I needed to do something big and crazy. And reality TV was popping, as they say. Mm. So I uh, went on Hell's Kitchen and won that in 07. And since, um, just sort of been diving into uh, giving back. Uh, service has always been big in my life. Mm -hmm. And my mother instilled that in us at a very young age. So definitely, you know, as a part of uh, DC Central Kitchen and the March of Dimes and now Central Union Mission and even Common Threads and many other uh, charitable efforts, it's really been important for me uh, in my career and uh, that will always be in my life. Uh, so uh, a couple years ago, about a year and a half ago, decided to start another company called Rock Solid Creative Food Group that really uh, takes ownership of my, and you know, artists like me, uh, take ownership of our art and our story. And that's uh, where I am now, creating concepts, programs, um, both visual and audio that uh, tell the story right. And you know, I don't have nobody to filter me. I can say what I want. <laughs> it's my radio show. So um, yeah, it's, it's really important to empower, for me to empower, educate, and entertain uh, right now through through my art and through my company. So, okay. and here we are today. Great. Yeah. So during your time during um, Hell's Kitchen and when you were filming that and pretty much your win afterwards, what did you not expect um, would come out of this? I mean, you went in with one expectation and then it was all over and you, you came out. What was, what was kind of that, that difference? What were you not uh, you know, thinking about at the time? Well, <laughs> that's a great question. Um, <laughs> Hell's Kitchen was, let me set it up a little bit. So when, when, when I applied to Hell's Kitchen, you know, it's TV. I'm a Virginia guy, cooked in D.C. my whole career. Uh, but you look at TV, it's Hollywood, you know. I figure it's, it's going to be a little Hollywood in there. And they send an email and they say, expect to be gone for up to six weeks. And I knew it was 12 episodes at the time. So I figured 12 episodes that's like two dinner services a week. That's easy. <laughs> right. Like I'm a crusher. And they like, oh, bring your, bring your swim trunks, bring your beach hat. Okay. You know, I didn't know that the swim trunks and the beach hat were for like digging through garbage. You know, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't understand that at the time. So probably the most uh, unexpected thing was, and it was a good thing it turned out, was that, you know, working for one of the, if not the best chef on the planet right now, um, Gordon Ramsay, was really, really, really hard. Uh, and there was no moment, there was not a moment where, you know, it was Hollywood. There was nothing Hollywood about it. <laughs> um, I felt like I had been cheated. Uh, 
<laughs> so so that was that was the toughest part, but it was a mm-hmm. good thing because I, I, I thrive under pressure. And I love environments like that where we had to, there were times in Hell's Kitchen where they told us, like we'd be talking about, you know, uh, production, if you will. I might say to you, uh, how are they going to show me? I'm going to look like an idiot last night with the risotto. And, you know, you say something back and, you know, it's like they play God and come over to loudspeakers and say, stop talking about production. You know, you're here for the competition. If you're not, if you don't want to focus on the competition, go home. Um, and that was, that was sort of, they were watching us. It was a little eerie. They watch us all the time, everywhere. But it was good because it was a very serious show in that they wanted to focus us to focus on the art. Um, so it was hard. It was unexpectedly really hard. Wow. But good. Right. Yeah. And afterwards, I'll tell you one, yeah. one little thing on the after. The after was, you know, I had this huge opportunity. Mm-hmm. We moved to Vegas mm-hmm. and, you know, my, my face is on billboards. Um, you know, it's, there's no sense of privacy. Um, mm-hmm. You know, I come from running a restaurant. You know, I was I was running B. Smith's as a chef and uh, the restaurant group there, B. Smith and her husband and the vice president. They really um, allowed me to be a big part of that restaurant's success. So I come from running a five million dollar a year restaurant. So I figure I'm going to Vegas to run my restaurant. I don't own it, but I'm the chef. And I wasn't the chef. I was and not to I'm not I don't want to bad mouth them. But it was a big shock for me. It was a huge shock. I was just a billboard. I was a billboard. I was kissing babies and shaking hands. You know, the chef, he didn't care if I started, if I started out at the host stand and spent the night at the host stand. He didn't care. He didn't ever had to come in this kitchen rock because this is my kitchen. And that was a big, big problem for me. You know, right, right. Uh, my ego was not in check at that point, And <laughs> I just came off of TV. It's my kitchen. Um, people came from Hawaii to see me. So that was a, that, I didn't expect that. I didn't right. expect to be treated uh, in that manner. I feel like we both could have done things differently. But it was a, it was a great learning lesson for me in business and in life and just, um, uh, you know, and just how to move forward in expectations. So I didn't, I didn't expect that at all, that blindsided me. And it was very hard for me. It was very, very hard for me. But I got through it. I'm alive. Right. How long were you in Vegas? And... A year. Okay. Um, uh, the contract was for a year. Okay. So we lived there longer than a year, but mm-hmm. uh, one year. Right. Yeah. Um, you know, we have to, you know, we came out with a lot of books and some people, you know, are kind of interesting. We, we've had a lot of discussion um, of, the, of the knowledge and the understanding of, of storytelling. Um, but before we get into storytelling, you started, you told a story of your own. Um, you wrote this, uh, this very interesting book that I actually love myself. So if you guys have not um, picked this up, this is the 44 things parents should know about healthy cooking for kids. And um, even though I don't cook for kids, um, it was something in which, like, I love the book for a couple reasons. One, I can open it up and just read a tip because it's no particular order. Um, But you give a lot of great practical advice. Um, Tell us a little bit about this. This was a a few years after um, Hell's Kitchen. You went to Vegas, and then you this concept came about. Uh, Tell us, talk us, talk us a little bit about this um, and how you how you came to it. Well, it, I will say that it works for adults as well. Yes, it does. Um, <laughs> yes, it does. Uh, the book came about, we were in the middle of, and I think we still are somewhat, uh, an obesity crisis in this country. I uh, have a beautiful family. And quite frankly, it's, it's tough. It's tough to answer the question, what is healthy? Right? I think we all, many of us, not all of us, struggle with what is healthy. Um, and healthy is different for me than it is for you mm-hmm. in, in a in very big way sometimes. And, but, but the, you know, we're not told that. We're told that you have to look and weigh and eat and do a certain thing and you are healthy. That's just nonsense. A lot of it is marketing nonsense to get us to buy a certain thing, um, to buy a lot of a certain thing and to mm-hmm. feel bad about ourselves and say, screw it. Mm-hmm. I'm going to just go ahead and eat and drink and be happy until next December. I'm going to make these resolutions again. <laughs> Um, and that's, you know, so, so what I wanted to do, that's very real for many, if not all of us, mm-hmm. what I wanted to do was give people a very, very practical and simple advice. You can find any recipe I believe online now. So I didn't want to do a cookbook, mm-hmm. uh, simple advice on how you can live a healthy lifestyle. So becoming more aware. One of the first chapters, skip commercials, you know, 
I mean, these are billion dollar companies and they have the ability to hack into your children's brain and hack into our brains. Mm -hmm. And very simple for them. I mean, it's really simple. The colors and the imagery, they know. They know what we like mm -hmm. and they know what gets us to click on, um, you know, the coupon at Chick-fil-A. They know. They understand it. So if you skip that, that means there's nothing wrong with a Chick-fil-A sandwich. There's nothing wrong with that. But if you skip that part, you're less likely to make these unhealthy decisions. So there are things like that. Drink more water, um, you know, uh, move, walk a little more, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, so in, in, at the end, the last chapter, smile, hugs, and give love. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. Forgive yourself. If you, you know, if you have the, the 750 venti latte, calorie venti latte from Starbucks, you know it was a bad decision. <laughs> You go across the street and you have a little duck donuts or, you know, Dunkin'. <laughs> you know you weren't supposed to do that. But nobody died, you know? I mean, literally. Like, you, but we shame ourselves and society shames us. And our friend, my son, my oldest son, shames me. Daddy, you say you're a vegan. <laughs> Where's my taco? I said that to me the other day. I'm like, I eat plants, but I can eat whatever I want. And I don't feel ashamed. Right. So I wanted a book that it's okay to be sort of normal. And here are some tips to, um, you know, move towards this, this definition of healthy. Yeah. One of the um, tips you have in here, and we, I mentioned it earlier, it's one of my favorite tips, by the way, is uh, fried is good, greasy is bad. So fried food is good, greasy is bad. But when you talk about healthy, what are you talking about? Well, you know, we're going to get into fried later. <laughs> we're going to get into fried later. I'm starting it off. Yeah. Fried, <laughs> frying, the art of frying is an art, mm -hmm. you know, and, and, and. In culinary school, they don't teach you about frying as they do sous vide or uh, sauteing or braising, right? These are techniques, these French techniques that are, you know, you have to have this great care when you're talking about sauteing. A little bit of heat. I mean, I'm sorry, a lot of heat, a little bit of oil, quickly. And I love that, right? <laughs> don't get me wrong. I love Johnson & Wales in my, in my classical training. But I'll tell you, one of the things that frying didn't get the same attention as deep frying in particular, didn't get the same attention or care as some of the other techniques. And there are reasons why, but in general, to fry doesn't mean it needs to be greasy, right? If you have the clean oil at the right temperature um, and, and the food's the right temperature and you do everything right, you bread it, you can fry. A lot of cultures fry, all cultures fry. Well, I don't say all, but a lot. So greasy is not good. We don't have this approach when, we, when it comes to like, you know, burgers a lot of times, right? But if you deep fry a piece of anything, if it's saturated with grease after you, you pick it out and let it sit on the rack for a little bit, that means you did something wrong. Mm -hmm. So it's okay, right? Maybe not every day. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, mm -hmm. maybe not the chicken minis and the tater rounds with the sweet tea every morning. <laughs> that might not be healthy. I can't judge you. <laughs> but if you're going to eat proper fried food, as in any other food, you need to know technically how it's supposed to be done, right? We can have this sort of explosion of calories, um, but it just needs to be done correctly. Greasy food is not good, you know? My grandmother didn't cook greasy food. Mm -hmm. She cooked some good fried food. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. Great. Um, we're definitely going to come back to that in a moment, but you've been doing so many things. I just want to be able to, to touch on a, a couple areas. Uh, your entrepreneurship. I mean, we have a lot of uh, one students, but as well as just interest in entrepreneurship. You have gone and taken entrepreneurship, one from, of course, a restaurant concepts, you may still be working on some things, to now an, a much larger discussion um, on, on that. Talk to us a little bit about, about your company and, you know, how did you come up with it and, and where do you see it going? Because you've got a lot, you've got a few things going on. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I was really inspired by, I'm a big uh, Jay-Z fan. And not just oh, him. Scott. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, I was really inspired by, you know, he created or, or bought title. And the, the, the story there is to empower artists to get more, you know, to get to, to benefit more from their own art. Right. So artists have been, you know, if you look at like Ray Charles, it's not new. Jay Z didn't create that narrative. Um, but I like what he did with that. And I, you know, I was really frustrated. Rock Solid was born out of frustration. You know, I worked for a couple of people a couple of years ago and I just wasn't happy with the output. I know the output, I'm putting my, I mean, I'm breaking my back into some of these companies. 
in these groups. And at the end of that, and it's part of it's on my, you know, it's on me, to, to the deal I sign up for, mm -hmm. right? Um, and the access to the deal. So uh, if I agree to it, I can't necessarily be mad, but um, I just said, hey, if I'm gonna put 80, 90 hours into anybody's anything, I need to walk away with it or a large part of it. Um, so I, I need to create my own. Uh, and that's what, that's what Rock Solid is about. And these TV shows, that oh, so many chefs want to be on television. And I think at this point, I mean, I could shoot a show, and I have, on my phone. I don't need Food Network or any of these companies. I could shoot it myself. The story will sell itself. I don't have the means to distribute it yet, but we have to create. You know, for these rappers I look at on SoundCloud and, you know, the free platforms. I heard Kevin Lyles, the um, former, I think he was the president of Def Jam. Mm -hmm. um, he said on, I think it was the Breakfast Club, he said, if you're a rapper and you don't have your music or your art recorded, or if you don't have the, you know, the means, if somebody asks you for your art right now in your pocket, he said, there's no excuse. He was comparing it with 1980, the 80s, when demo tapes were so hard to get into the hands of a producer or a DJ or whatever. Now, there's just no excuse for you not, ha not to have your own content, your own art. So food is a little different, but I, th I want to do TV. And I started thinking about it. You know, I approached these people and I asked them to invest in my ventures. And, um, you know, there's all these sort of strings attached. And you know, I want to own my content at the end of the day, right? If you sign up for Food Network or Bravo, which are wonderful platforms, it's not a knock on them. But I'm an artist and I want to own my, I don't want to be tied to some of these contracts to where I have to do and say what you want me to do. And after 20 years of putting in work, you still own my image, my likeness, my brand, and I can't make a move without you. That's not my kind of deal. It works for a lot of people. A lot of my friends have these deals and they work for them. Not me. I need to own my own content. Um, and I want to empower other artists like me. So mm -hmm. my group is not just about me. It's about empowering other artists that simply want to create. If you want to create concepts, you want to create, uh, you want to host your own podcast, then I want to be the place where, um, just like some of these streaming services, I want to be the place where we produce it together, but you own a big part of it because it's your show. You're the talent. So I, I strongly believe in giving other people the opportunity to walk away with, you know, their art at the end of uh, whatever the end is. Right. I know one of the um, concepts that I saw on YouTube is you are, you're interested in a late night talk show or, or you have a, a piece of this uh, sort of uh, piloted um, a little teaser called Shift Drink. Um, and you mentioned in there that music similar to food is a source of inspiration for people. And you quoted the fact that really the 444 album um, was something that was really inspirational sort of for you with that. Do you sort of see yourself continuing on with that and this whole concept of owning your, owning your recipes like owning your masters? Absolutely. Um, 444, uh, Jay-Z's album last year was, I mean, it was just, it was like a sonic boom to me. Uh, I was up in... Cape Cod when it came out of all places. <laughs> I'm listening, I'm driving down Main Street in Chatham, blasting Jigga. You know, it didn't go over too well. But uh, it was, uh, it was trans transformative to me mm -hmm. um, as far as, you know, the legacy I want to leave behind, not only for my family, but for, for so many people behind me or that are coming behind me. Um, so, you know, we shot a show called Shift Drink. I shot about three or four. I have another one that's coming out, still on the floor, still being edited. And it's a show where, you know, we're chefs and we sit around. Uh, we have um, uh, the first shift drink uh, oh, uh, <laughs> participant, Katie. Uh, hello. Uh, we <laughs> talked about food and politics out at National Harbor. Um, sorry, that took a minute to, to come back. But <laughs> what we do in this industry, we actually, we sit around and drink after work, right? I mean, we all do yep. it. I think our happy hour is like midnight, 1 a.m. Because while y'all at happy hour, or the people that are not in the industry, <laughs> we're working. We're the ones serving you. So what I wanted to do, I saw that we had some great conversations over the years. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you're like, you know, I, I know you a little bit too much now. I don't, I'd rather not speak to you anymore. <laughs> but many times what happens is we humanize one another as we mm -hmm. see over a beverage or food. So... I, I don't see you as the cook from El Salvador or the, you know, the, the server that lives in McLean 
or the manager that lives in McLean, I should say. Um, <laughs> uh, I see you as a human being now because mm -hmm. we've had an opportunity to break bread and, and share a beverage. So I wanted to put a camera on that, you know, and we did. And it's really cool. And the next one is about, you know, I got uh, four other African-American men and we talked about legacy and we talked about ego and we talked about some of our, our trappings of our history, our own personal histories. And then we talked about how we moving it forward. Um, so, and, and we, did, we talked a little bit about food, but the idea of my programming also is not to just be, hi, I'm Jeff Rock, welcome to my kitchen. You know, that's cool, but that's been done before. Um, to see me on TV cooking Southern food is not, I do it, but it's been done before. I don't want to do anything that's necessarily been done before. But chefs have passions in music and art and politics, and we, we, we care about things other than food or sort of that surround food. Mm -hmm. So part of my mission is to capture those things and allow people an opportunity to express themselves. Mm -hmm. So, um, so yeah, so that's what um, the shift drink is about and 444 edition will be out soon. Great. Yeah. The um, extension of your, <laughs> pod, your podcast as well. Um, you hit on some really heavy uh, topics um, and um, both of regarding food, but also the restaurant industry in itself. Um, I know you have to follow this podcast, SoundCloud. Um, talk, talk just a little bit about your podcast, but kind of just kind of narrow down to us one or two areas um, and issues you think is, is really hot and needs discussion on the next. Well, obviously, so. yeah, I have a, I, we just yeah. um, recorded several episodes yep. the other day and obviously the, me too movement and managing in this business in during the this 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 you know this shift in our culture mm -hmm. so i'm actually headed to new york on friday to have a closed door discussion james beard is facilitating this danny meyer i forget it's a couple other people danny meyer of uh union square the shake shack guy um <laughs> men only they're having a discussion of what we're going to do. And I was so happy when I got this email. Mm -hmm. um, I said, you're damn right we need to have this discussion. Mm -hmm. uh, because, you know, there's a lot of resistance to, you know, you can't say anything anymore. And I recorded a podcast on that. So that'll be coming out soon. One of the things, and I want to talk, I mean, absolutely real. You know, I want to be so real and so authentic. What that, what that, I want to provide a space where people can be themselves and tell the truth about some of the decisions we as men have made um, in this industry. And you have to have a space that people are allowed to tell the truth. And there's gonna be some reactions as a result of you telling the truth, but you, you wanna tell the truth before the truth is told on you and, and you wanna be able to control the story. I think that is extremely important for us to, a lot of my friends, a lot of guys I know, are really resistant to having this conversation. And it's like, well, we got to start having a conversation. We just have to start somewhere. I get it. I understand that you want to tell that joke. But you got to understand, think about it. If, you, if I'm black, there were certain jokes 30 years ago, not even 30 years ago, but that were acceptable to tell. If you were a woman in the workplace, there were certain things that were acceptable. If you look at like Mad Men, right? There were certain things that were acceptable 30 years ago, but it's not 30 years ago. Mm -hmm. So stop holding on to that. And do some people overreact, men and women? Of course, yes, that's life. But until we have this honest conversation, like we're not going to get anywhere. So that's going to be one of my more um, explosive, not explosive, sort of, you know, hopefully it's explosive, but I really want to tackle that because and some guys have to do it, you know. And then after that, I talk about three ways what we have to do is, you know, we got to, we got to, uh, we got to ask a question, we got to shut up and listen, and we got to do something about it. So it's a lot of celebrity chefs that are talking, and I think that's great. And I'll tell you one point. I'm, I'm helping Common Threads, Art Smith's um, uh, mm -hmm. uh, nonprofit, with a, with a dinner in May. And I'm sitting around at a meeting the other day. We actually had to do this for a little bit to think about women chefs in certain restaurant groups. And does that mean that these chefs and owners are sexist or discriminating against women? No, it doesn't necessarily mean that. But what we have to do is the people in power have to ask the question, why aren't there? Many times it might, they might just not be interested. That, that could be it. But we can't rely on our own understanding of, oh, I'm, I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. 
I'm a good guy. I'm a good guy. <laughs> the great woman chef came along. I'm a good guy. We can't stop there. We have to ask the question and then ask the people affected by it. Why do you think you're not promoted in this company? And then listen to the answers. Don't judge them and allow. And then that's where the magic happens. Uh, so that's something I want to be a part of because I know in some sort of way I've been a part of, you know, uh, I've just been a part of the industry. So, uh, yeah, so that's, that's coming soon to a podcast near you. <laughs> Well, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, <coughs> let's shift gears a little bit. Um, as we, as I mentioned before, about one of the sections I was really interested in, and you know, fried is good, greasy is bad, and um, I want to kind of go down this 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 conversation now um, about um, fried food, cultural appropriation. Your winning dish on Hell's Kitchen was fried chicken. Uh, with uh, crab, it was crab cakes. With crab with cakes. crab cakes. I mean, Chesapeake you can't... surf and turf, I call it. Yeah. You, I mean, this was your winning dish. This is how you won, you know, Gordon Ramsay over. But we are at a time, and I think it's all, maybe it's, maybe we're just having conversation. Maybe it's always been the case in which this concept of, of really this cultural appropriation um, as it relates uh, to food. And historically, I know we're going to go down and tell this story, but first of all, kind of tell us what, what do you think? What's your uh, definition of cultural appropriation? And then take us down this road of, 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 let's talk a little bit about fried chicken in itself. But let's first talk about the concept and how you view cultural appropriation. Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know, think I've ever looked the term up. It seems that to me, it's your people in power are taken from those who are not in power and not, you know, uh, paying their due respects and how that, how you define due respect is a, or the, the, the props, giving them their props and whether that's monetary or just, uh, um, sort of, I don't know. It's just people are, are robbing. <laughs> That's how I just, like, you're taking from something, which is okay. All chefs do that, right? Whether we want to admit it or not, we're always watching and we're always taking. Nothing is original. But you have to pay homage in some. Now, how you pay homage, I think, is the tricky part. Because mm -hmm. I can say, I'm paying homage, but I told you I, I, I got this Nashville hot chicken from, I was inspired by you. That's homage. Well, if you're making 50 million now, and I'm still in my little shack. Um, I don't know if that's enough homage. So my, my, that's my de that's sort of my loose definition of it is you're not you're not paying backward what you, from what you what you took. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So with that, then how then would you kind of take us down this historical connection, really, with fried chicken as it you know, from from the Scots perspective to this sort of negative stereotype of fried chicken, black Americans, and where does this sit today? It's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> so take a step by it step. It is very um, tricky and complicated, this idea of where we are with fried chicken, because it has sort of a couple of legs and a couple of paths. I'll, I'll try to do the really quick version. This is the one thing that I've been thinking about um, the hardest. Mm -hmm. So the Scots are credited with inventing or the first to do it. There's a lot of recipes, a lot of British recipes. And um, I've never been to the UK, but apparently they, they got more fried chicken restaurants than us. Um, uh, maybe that's like London or something, but there's a lot of fried chicken over there. So that had to start somewhere. Uh, so we didn't even, black people, African-Americans didn't even we weren't the first to do it. There's no scholarship that supports that, that we were the first to do it. But here's a clear definition. Well, somewhere along the line, right, after the Civil War, uh, you know, racists in power, well, got upset when black people started getting things like rights, you know, constitutional rights. Uh, you know, you got to treat them like humans now. They were really pissed off about that. So what they had to do is remind black folks that no matter what the Constitution says, you're still low. Everything about you, your hair, 
your nose, your culture, the way you walk, the way you talk, what you eat is low. And not only is it low, it is the lowest. So they used images, right, that we've probably all seen with the heavy set black woman that is uh, sweating with the Enchimama bandana um, in the cooking, in the kitchen, cooking fried chicken, bug eyed, big lipped, um, uneducated. And then, you know, the black man stealing the chickens. So through visual means, chicken and then fried chicken was put on us as a negative thing. And a couple of things happened there. People believed it, right? So you had racist white folks that believed it, but you also had black people that believed it to the, to the degree that they said, I need to separate myself from that image. So why would they choose fried chicken? I've been struggling with this. Well, why would they choose that? And if you look at it, it's a, it's a source of empowerment. If you look at the women of Gordonsville, Virginia, that, that, that were waiter carriers, um, I think in the 60, 1860s or 70s, I'm sorry. But they, they train stop. There's a train stop, no food cart, really hot. Um, they use chicken to, to make money. Uh, and, and they served the people on the train. The train would slow down in Gordonsville, Virginia, and they would, you know, sell them coffee and biscuits and fried chicken, and people would uh, plan their routes to go through, um, you know, their vacations or with their travel routes to go through to make sure they were on that train because the chicken was so good. Uh, so, so I'm like, well, why would they choose fried chicken? Well, because this is actually something that if they look into the history of fried chicken and they looked into what – uh, African-American women in particular did with chicken and how they empowered themselves, they would actually feel better about themselves. So not only do we need to take that away, we need to actually make it so it is seemingly low. If you take a picture of a black man and you, no matter what you do, you take a picture, you draw a picture, and then you put a drumstick in his hand, that's just like calling the N-word. That's how bad, that's how much they thrust this negative stereotype on African-Americans. The very good job, the very good, a very successful marketing campaign, I would say. And I had, why? Why would they do that? Because when I look and I read, there's so rich, so much rich history in that bird. So then, you know, the people in power didn't want me to know, man, if he knows this, she knows this, mm -hmm. they're going to feel good about themselves. Which brings us forward to today and why, what, what I'm challenged by most as it relates to fried chicken. Many of my friends are like, even black friends, like, what is wrong with you walking around talking about some fried chicken? <laughs> you got fried chicken? I got a fried chicken sticker <laughs> on my phone. One, I'm tired of giving Apple all this free advertisement, <laughs> cover up that little Apple. But I figured I would start there, mm -hmm. me because it leads us into a broader discussion. We are not, I, I wanna make sure everyone's clear, we are not limited by fried chicken, collard greens, macaroni and cheese, Southern food in, in general, or the typical, what, what we think of Southern food. African-American cooks are so much bigger than that. Um, and and as, are, as are many cooks. But I figured if I could start there, then we can tell a broader story. And the second thing is that if somebody was in a coma, Let's just say you were in Como, you moved away, you went, to, you went to the moon for 30 years, and you came back to D.C., you said, man, guess what's happening on the food scene? Southern food, soul food, is like booming. <laughs> oh, word? Who, who's at the top? Is it B. Smith? Is it Florida Avenue Grill? Is it, you know, is it you, Rock? No, you know what I mean. See, I pulled up in this, in this uh, raggedy Hyundai. <laughs> No, it's no one that's African-American. No, no, what you mean no one? No one. No one in this sudden boom that is being embraced by, you know, restaurant associations and trade associations, this culture, this, this, it, it, there, there's no representation of people that have cooked their food their entire lives, what their grandmother cooked for them, right? 
If you look at the top chefs, you look at Jose Andres, he's really good at what his grandmother, his mother cooked for him. Okay, mm -hmm. Eric Repair, Jeff Bubin, you can name any of them. Any chef, Daniel Ballou came to prominence when he started doing some of his best cooking, when he started cooking from his heart, from his memories. We all, as chefs, we all shy away from, even David Chang talks about, you know, being ashamed, you know, even in Indian cultures, you would be ashamed as a kid. You don't really understand the importance, the building blocks that your, your mothers and your aunts, and I use women because women are generally at the forefront of all of this anyway, but you don't understand the culinary building blocks that they're giving you or the cultural, the, the importance that they, when you're, when you're a kid, but later on you understand like, wow, they were feeding me and you go back to that. And that's generally, you can look at any chef, just about any chef, generally when you start doing your best work when you cook from the heart, when you cook what was on your Saturday, whatever your Sunday morning was or your Sunday dinner was, when you cook from there, that's when your, if not your career, you feel great about everything and it just all falls into place. Except for African-American chefs. We've not been allowed the opportunity to cook from that space and be celebrated the same way that other cultures have been and to achieve the same high level success. I mean, the, the, the most popular guy is crazy. The most popular guy, black chef, is a dude that's not even from here, right? And he decided he wanna cook Southern food and he's like the hottest thing ever. He's Marcus Samuelson. And no disrespect to Marcus, he's a, he's a great chef. He's a great chef. And I, hear his, uh, you know, I have chefs that work for him. He's a great chef. But we have to want, here's what I, always, what I want. Here's what I desire. Here's what I'm going to do. So we have to ask the question, why? I have my theory as to why, right? Mm -hmm. But we have to ask the question. Ram W, our association here, James Beard, all these associations, we have to ask the question, why has that success not, why do you not see more people that look like me at that top level? And now, Johnson & Wales told me, like, your fried chicken, no, 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 no. If you want to get five stars, no, 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 no. We don't do macaroni and cheese, buddy. You're not going to make the cover of food and wine with collard greens and ham hocks and catfish. No. You want to cook this French food, my friend, or this Italian food. Okay, so what do we do? We assimilate. I know I'm going on. I'm going to wrap this up in a second. We assimilate. We say, all right, I can't cook from my heart. Many cooks do that. It's not just our culture. Many cooks do that. But our cuisine wasn't hot. You know, Korean food wasn't hot up until recently. But when Korean food gets its boom, you're not surprised to see a bunch of Korean chefs getting the credit. So when Southern food gets its boom, when I see Sean Brock and Hugh Atchison and Ed Lee, who's a, who's, who's a, a son of Koreans that was from Brooklyn and moved to Kentucky and fell in love with my food, I'm not mad at him. I think it's a wonderful food. But you see no people that look like the people that cooked this for centuries, that built this, that built this country in a large part. We have to ask the question, why is that? That objective question is the same question I'm, I'm saying men need to ask in the midst of all, you know, the, the Me Too movement. The restaurant industry has to ask, why don't we see in Washington, D.C.? So, mm -hmm. soapbox off. <laughs> no, no, this is great. Right. But even when food is written, um, when food is, is written in magazine articles, um, when there's a tendency to be um, some food that seems to be more or less prepared by brown people, it's, you know, it's, 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 it's not as at the same quality, or if it is prepared differently, it's the words that are used are, you know, you know exquisite, um, you know, just, you know, you know earth shattering, um, et cetera. Have you even seen within the writing? Um, there, there be a difference in descriptions. Absolutely. I mean, it's, I mean, it's just, yeah, it's, it's different. I mean, if you look at some of the, you know, critics are going to be critics, right? Um, a lot of my friends obviously are chefs and a lot of them do not like Tom Sietzema or, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's a critic. You can't expect the critic did not be a critic, right? But what troubles many chefs and I think you'll find this beyond African American chefs. There, there is a certain, there can be a certain slant or a certain, you know, it's just described different, you know, how you use certain words. And sometimes it's true, you know, we as chefs and artisans, we have to be sort of objective. Well, it is kind of homey, you know, we don't mm -hmm. like that, but it's, it, you know, it's, it's, it's very, it's a very tricky situation 
with the writing. It, part of that too is me as I've become more aware, I try not to worry about the affirmation of too many people. I really don't care if I know I'm living from an authentic space. Like on, on, on Hell's Kitchen, I had this moment of, I understand, I have to be me. I can't be anybody else but me. If I lose being me, then that's fine. Uh, so part of that in the writing is, okay, they wrote about it and they called it this and they sort of said that, but I think we have to get to an authentic place where we just, we have to own, we have to own us. You know, and I, I, I don't know if that's totally what you're asking, but mm -hmm. that's okay. Mm -hmm. Writers are going to write. And the other thing, why I created my company, you want something better? Write it. Get some writers. You know, start a blog. And Washington Post, I mean, this is Yelp. You got Yelp leaders, right? You, you know, in the world of Yelp, which I, uh, um, I'm sorry to all my Yelpers, <laughs> but there's <laughs> some bad people on Yelp out here. <laughs> some ill intent. We got, we got one star one time. We weren't even open. They were mad because we were not open. <laughs> and you don't allow this to go through. So anyway, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> that's the next form. Uh, but if you don't like what they're writing, then employ a blog. It's, not, it's nothing to start a blog. And then employ some writers. And allow some people that you think understand your culture a little better to write about you. And rank it high. You know, hire a tech person to make sure your, yours go, rank high on Google. Like part of it is just part of the game. And, but it becomes okay with, I'm okay. I'm, I'm all right with whatever they wrote. That's fine. Mm -hmm. The, um, just last month um, at NYU, and it's kind of, you know, the reason why I want to bring this up is because you're coming from a perspective of a chef, you know, platform, celebrity chef, you have that, but they're still just us to just live in every day. And uh, last month, which February being Black History Month, um, a student at NYU, so NYU came up, um, they decided to, to, to have a, a Black History Month uh, menu um, as, part of, as part of their you know, food service dining area. And um, the menu was presented, a student saw it, and it had you know, fried chicken and watermelon flavored Kool-Aid and you know, those avenues. And she asked the question of, uh, you know, of the, of the people who work there, you know, you know, you know what is this? How did you come up with the menu? Um, she received the immediate answer was, well, why, you know, why are you complaining about this? Black people came up with this menu. Uh, later on, we find out that, you know, that wasn't necessarily the case, but she was not as a student, you know, really happy about it. So she just went and, you know, communicated this to administration and it ended up resulting and later on and people end up getting terminated. At the reason why I'm uh, introducing this topic is because where do we meet the point of you should have known and so therefore we're going to fire you to then knowledge, which we are going to continue on with. The lack of knowledge, uh, was, is it an ignorance thing or is it a, you know, we just kind of let this slide? I mean, we're, we're kind of in, in that conversation when we're just living our lives every day. You know, I, I saw the NYU story um, and, you know, Questlove did something like this at NBC's cafeteria, it was sort of a tweet a couple of years ago, NBC on Martin Luther King or Black History Month, whose idea was it to serve? He tweeted it out and then everybody got their all, ah, fried chicken. Like, first of all, Martin Luther King loved fried chicken. And this is a problem for black folks. Like, it's like in-house Things that, you know, it's, it's very tricky for us. That whole thing that happened, that imagery, is real. There's a lot of black people that will not eat fried chicken in public or in front of white people. And I find that crazy. I remember I went to 11 Madison. I remember I, 11 Madison Park, Danny Meyer's um, restaurant. We went, I don't know if you remember, years ago. And I could hear my chef friends telling me now, don't order the chicken. Like my elitist <laughs> black chef friends, don't you go in there and order that chicken. <laughs> Excuse me, I want the fucking chicken. <laughs> this is one of the best restaurants now in the world. Why do I have to hide who, what I want? Mm -hmm. You know? So part of it is, one, in those instances, somebody's going to be pissed off. Somebody's going to be upset. And you have to have a conversation. I believe that's what happens. You don't ask, you know, is this okay? And then if it's, I don't know about NYU's menu, but 
how often do they serve ribs? You know, if you just serve ribs once on February 12th, 2018, that's a problem. You know, like ribs are good. Everybody, everybody's ribs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So why do you, you know, some of that is internal. The student that got upset about it, mm -hmm. maybe I didn't understand the broader context, but that's not a bad menu to me. The problem is, you know, watermelon Kool-Aid rubbed a lot of people. It's like, like black people know, black people, we, we grew up on Kool-Aid. Like all the colors, <laughs> not even flavors, forget watermelon, all the colors. <laughs> Red, <laughs> different forms of red. But the problem then becomes, what are you saying about this menu? Are you reducing me to red Kool-Aid? Are you, because Kool-Aid is one of those things also, when we talk about poverty, uh, poverty is being labeled as low. Poor people, I was poor. And I, I don't mind, I know restaurant groups that it's cool now, the hipsters have groups, it's cool for them, right? This is what we talk about appropriation. These hipster restaurant groups that have these Kool-Aid flavored cocktails in Shaw. It's just like, wait a second, you know, what's going on here? So I think in, in these university cafeterias, you just have to have a conversation. And it's about the broader context. You know, Twitter can go crazy, but the broader context, do we serve fried chicken on January? Like we, if we, if you serve meals that represent the people that you're trying to, you know, serve your student body, just relax. Nobody should be fired or anything. There's nothing offensive about that. See, this is the, the, this is the, I don't want to lecture black folks, but we have to understand. And, you know, you talk about college students as well. Like, I remember I was in college. Like, you want to, you get upset about something, you know, you're going to know about it quickly. Right. Um, but there is great value in history in barbecue. Right. There is. So what's the story beyond that? I'm not offended if you have a barbecue menu or fried chicken or macaroni or collard greens during Black History Month, depending upon the broader context. What those, it didn't sound like, you know, maybe they didn't have a conversation with, with the students. I don't, I don't, I, it doesn't bother me at all. You know, if, if um, what's, a, what's a, the best restaurant in D.C. If, if I don't know, if um, the guy at a Pearl, Pineapple and Pearls, if they decide on February 12th, to have a, you know, a fried chicken shindig, you know, we're gonna have a problem. That's not what you do, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's not what you do, Adam, uh, but he's not doing that. So I think the, the context matters. Great. We're, I would like to um, definitely start, begin to open up some uh, Q and A's uh, for, for you, but prior to that, why don't you uh, talk to us a little bit about some of the information that you sort of brought for us today and you kind of lead uh, the class, Professor. Okay. <laughs> well. <laughs> I'm a little intimidated by you saying that from a true <laughs> professor, but um, what I did, you know, I have some books here that I think are important. Um, as, you know, I was researching for this and, you know, again, I want to thank you all for being here. I think it's really important that we ask questions and we have kind of conversations, uh, open and honest conversations. And, um, the, the, there, there are people that are way, that went to like real college, like you all, you know, I went to cooking school. No, it was a good cooking school, but these, these are scholars, you know, and, and, and some friends of mine. And I think that as I started to look and understand the depth is so deep. I mean, it's so deep, our, our history, but definitely our cooking history. And I just wanted to bring, I brought them also for strength, maybe if I need to refer to a couple of quotes, but um, Soul Food is by Adrian Miller and the President's uh, Kitchen Cabinet. Um, President's Kitchen Cabinet is a book that details all of the African Americans' contributions to the, um, you know, to, the, to the kitchen of the White House from Washington to Obama. Uh, and it's, it's so amazing when you read this book and you understand the different times uh, and people, you know, were doing their jobs like no matter what. And, it, you know, and we talk about from Washington to Obama, talking about very, and it, very different times. And the president's kitchen, like the White House kitchen, I've been in there. It's nice now. But for many years, it was not nice. It was like uh, it was a horrible place to be. And it's not like this big old kitchen either. They do some amazing work out of there, out of a very mm -hmm. small space. So, um, my so uh, Jessica B. Harris is a she's a scholar, and she's just a wonderful. Uh, her, her approach on um, you know the uh, just the, the food ways and diaspora is uh, just mind blowing. 
mind blown. She actually designed the menu uh, or helped design the menu at the uh, African American Museum. So this is her memoir right here, but in it she has a a uh, when she talks about chicken, she has a um, she's talking about it's called Monday Mommy's Sunday Roast Chicken. If I can read you the passage a little bit. Uh, it says, the Southern tradition of chicken on Sunday was often respected in my house when I was growing up. It was either, it was usually either fried or roasted. My mother, the former dietitian, made sure that however it was served, it was accompanied by at least two vegetables and a salad. Back then that meant iceberg lettuce and a few cottony tomatoes and a slice of onion. <laughs> fried chicken was my childhood favorite, but as I got older, I began to appreciate the virtues of a good roast chicken. And it was one of the first dishes I mastered when I moved out on my own. It's still one on which I pride myself and judge other cooks. And I love that. And it, this book is about her personal story. She was friends with Maya Angelou. She goes in to talk about, um, you know, and she was, uh, her, her, her lover was uh, James Baldwin's brother, uh, or maybe close friend. But anyway, it's just like this sort of really cool mm -hmm. social circle when you see these artists just vibing with each other in a very important time in black history. Um, in, in New York and, and just her approach to her food and her culture and her exploration. And, you know, when I read how she adores chicken and her Sundays, I start thinking about, you know, Thomas Keller. Thomas Keller, he's allowed to tell his story about roast chicken. And that's one of the, he was my inspiration to like serve roast chicken as family meal in my restaurants because he talked about how simple and how great a meal it was. Um, and I think, you know, it, it just reminds me of that. And I think, you know, all chefs should be able to speak from that space, that home space. Uh, and the cooking gene is a great exploration and high on the hog is as well. Um, so I just bought them for strength. Uh, mm -hmm. They're very, um, they're very uh, good books. And I encourage you to get that book as well, that green book over there, uh, even if it just sits on your shelf. But it's no, I'm joking. It's a good book. Um, so, yeah, that's 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 what I got from the from the book category. OK. Oh, there's another one called the Jemima Code. It's not here with me. There's two other ones. I'm sorry. Jemima Code by Tony Tipton Martin. Jemima Code is a is a collection of this. She has this amazing rest, uh, cookbook collection of of all of these you know these old recipes from uh, black cooks, and it really talks about the Aunt Jemima sort of phenomenon in this country. And I, I don't have it yet, um, but I've, I've studied sort of around it. So um, it's, I've heard uh, Tony Tipton Martin speak and just, uh, it's just very interesting. We're, we've been reduced. And a lot of times we do that. It's not just our culture. We're up here talking about this, but we, we tend to do that in general. Mm -hmm. You know, we tend to reduce uh, Vietnamese to like bon me, it, Vietnamese bon me, right? Yeah. So we would tend to reduce a culture to one thing or like three things, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? So, once we look further, we see that, you know, it's more expansive and diverse than we actually uh, maybe anticipated. So this is my culture and my history. And uh, I think, you know, all of ours is, is Americans. So I just think it's really cool to, uh, to dive in and learn a little more about it. If you have any questions, please, there are microphones to, the, to my right and my left. Um, please, um, whenever you have the opportunity, please come and uh, ask your question. Um, and speaking of this as uh, Americans and representing Americans, uh, you had the, really the, the very unique opportunity to serve as a culinary diplomat. Um, during uh, during the um, previous administrations where we had um, that as, a, as an option. Um, Talk to us just a little bit about kind of that experience um, representing what you do on the global stage, and then we'll bring it back. Yeah, well, I was uh, a part of the Culinary Diplomatic Partnership at the USA Department, which was pretty, pretty amazing. Uh, I originally got introduced to the program when, I forget the name of the organization, but a bunch of chefs from around the world, it's a leadership program. Uh, by the State Department, they came. I was working at the D.C. Central Kitchen, and about 20, maybe even 30 chefs or food people from around the world came to the D.C. Central Kitchen as a part on their tour of America. Uh, and D.C. Central Kitchen, if you're not familiar, uses food as a tool to empower folks, uh, uh, build up communities. And I was working there at the time as the director of the kitchen, and you get like 30 men and women from around the world with all of these unique perspectives. And it, I was only with them for one afternoon, 
but you want to just talk about, you know, getting out of your American bubble for a moment. It was a really eye opening experience for me because, you know, things just, I mean, we, most of us know now, but I, you just don't know until you know that everything is not the same or it's not even similar. It's not even close in some, some, some other countries. It's not even close. Um, so that was my first introduction when having people come to us. And what Hillary Clinton started the program, she and Capricia Marshall, in an attempt to make chefs ambassadors, because food is the tool. So if we, you know, sit down at the table, we're going to negotiate anyway about some things, right? If you and our country, mm -hmm. you're going to talk about some things. We know we got to talk. Like we got to, our country is meeting with another country mm -hmm. very soon. Um, we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Some very serious things. That's why we have these state dinners. When you put food there, and we just mm -hmm. say, let's just talk, let's just eat business later. Put a little fried chicken in the middle, you know, some red wine, maybe some bourbon for me. <laughs> After that, right. we're gonna talk about your family. You're gonna talk about where you came from. Mm -hmm. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna do the same, maybe share some fears and some of our, you know, experiences. I see a human, right? I see a human being. I don't necessarily see, you know, a country or a problem that I need to negotiate with. Mm -hmm. And ambassadors know this, they know this. Mm -hmm. What the, the program said, well, let us, you know, let's send in our chefs and let's exchange, right? We learn, they learn. Mm -hmm. And then afterwards, the diplomacy is a little, it's, it, it's easier. Uh, so I, I went to Bogota, Colombia, um, which just blew my mind so much. Um, Cartagena, Colombia, I went to Jamaica, um, and also I, I met with several chefs here. So that was just an amazing, amazing experience. And I was so fortunate. Uh, you know, I hope they bring it back, but it doesn't look like, uh, you know, uh, Trump would bring a, a Clinton program back. <laughs> I don't think that would sort of fit. <laughs> uh, but anyway, it was great. Yeah. Great. Thank you. So. Any comments or questions? Yes, please, please. Hi, my name's Kirsten. I have a question for you. If you could have dinner with your favorite American, living or dead, who would you choose and what would you serve for dinner? First of all, you know what I would serve for dinner. <laughs> um, what ah, else? <laughs> so living or dead, living or dead. What else? You mean besides fried chicken? Right, what would you serve for dinner? Oh, okay, I see, the entire meal. So living or dead. Ooh. Living or dead, living or dead. Edna Lewis. I've been asked this question so many times. And yeah. Um, Edna Lewis, who's a, not, book is not up here, but she was a chef out of Virginia, grandchild of freed slaves, and they created a town called Freetown in Virginia. They built this town, and she was one of my heroes. When she was at my um, graduation, uh, she was receiving an honorary doctorate at uh, Johnson of Wales in Norfolk. I'd love to have a meal with her. I actually wouldn't be so scared to serve her fried chicken. Um, <laughs> But my mother made a mean uh, short rib. She was big on brazen. You know, we used to buy cheap cheap cuts from Murray's. Remember Murray? Murray's still around? But Mur Murray's used to be cheap right down on H, it was H Street. Um, so we used to buy the miscuts. cuts. And, you know, I didn't know what that meant. I thought that was a cut of beef. Uh, so my mother was good, you know, with a, with, with a miscut. I mean, literally on the box, it said miscut. I'm like, somebody missed a cut. Uh, so I... We be, she was great at braising because you couldn't just cook those like a steak. So I would probably cook her some braised short ribs, mashed potatoes, and uh, maybe some, some onion rings or something like that. And uh, I know she was a Virginia woman, so I think she liked bourbon as well. So that, that would be, it'd be uh, her. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Um, I'm doing research right now on defining luxury today, and I thought you would be an interesting to person to ask about this, given that you've done everything from, you know, helping open up Ben's Chili Bowls to Gordon Ramsay, and obviously you won with fried chicken that isn't kind of a conventional luxury dish. So I'm wondering how you see customer perceptions of luxury are shifting, shifting in the restaurant world today, and, you know, what changes you're seeing and what you expect in the future for that? A wonderful question. I think that as we know more as consumers, uh, luxury is, is you know, evolving kind of quickly. So back in the day, if you will, you know, just high price, high ticket items, you could define as luxury. Now you can still, still do that, we still do that. But people know more, so you, it's harder to pull the wool over someone's eyes just because you say it's 
you know, you could walk out into a dining room 20 years ago and talk about cilantro and people would be like, oh, the chef is talking about cilantro. <laughs> and now you got like eight year old kids like, yeah, I was cooking cilantro last night, buddy. You know, tell me something else. Uh, this guy's a hack. Um, so I think that, uh, you know, we, we as chefs want to get, um, you know, what ever, no one else has. So we'll search high and low through our distributors. We want the backdoor stuff. We're asking people when they travel abroad to get us ingredients that you can't get here. And consumers as well want that same experience. They want the next thing that you ain't got. So I can tweet and Instagram about it and tell you I had this before you. So having these sort of unique, exclusive experiences, um, uh, I think that's extremely valuable now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great question. <laughs> Hello. Hi. Hi. Um, my name is Adrian Wilson. I'm a student here at Georgetown, second year um, in the hospitality program. And I'm very passionate about food. I have a food blog called Feed Our Soul. You're welcome to check it out. Um, <laughs> if you want to. <laughs> um, so I'm also doing some research um, for my capstone about food deserts, actually, and their existence and how they came about. Um, and I more so want to pose a question to you because you talked a little bit about obesity and you talked a little bit about paying homage um, to, you know, where these cultures came from. Um, and so I want to know, how would you, what is your advice or what would you do and give to, you know, leaders of the hospitality community about how to change the conversation about food deserts, you know, malnutrition, about what's happening in the food industry, about the, the imbalance between, you know, paying $50 for fried chicken and compared to people who can't even get food and they're in the black communities that are made and created black food fried chicken. So I just want to know what you think about that. Well, I mean, that's, that's a wonderful, wonderful um, question. I think that we have to be aware as food people, I don't want to limit it to chefs. We have to be aware of our surroundings and we have to use our, our power in like in a, in a good way. So I'll give you a sort of a, an example of that in Ward 7 and 8 in D.C., I mean, there have been a couple of examples of grocery stores that have gone over there and not served the community. And, you know, they, they're just like tone deaf, right? Yeah, I remember the, the moms on the mom's organic market on Pennsylvania Avenue. I went to do a, a demo at Greater Southeast um, for, you know, to teach poor people essentially how to cook healthy. And I, had, I, I needed some squash. So I went and bought some frozen butternut squash. It was $8 a bag for like eight ounces. And I'm like, okay, this doesn't seem like a good concept. I don't know who decided to do this. I know what Mom's is, right? It's a, it's a really good store. But who decided that this was a good spot for this? So what developer said this was a good idea? Did they see something else coming, maybe? And they, they totally discounted the people that are already there? Um, so what I, think it, what, I, what, what I think has to happen, several things have to happen. But when we talk about, you know, Poor people are always are often the discussion of, you know, you need to make better choices when I don't have access to healthy, uh, affordable food. So as a food person, we can advocate, we can lobby, right? We can use our power and influence some of the restaurant groups here, some of the connection to farmers. And it's not a sort of a, a me thing. It's an us thing. We have to actually speak to the community, go into the community and say, hey, what do you need? So uh, not to make this a DC central kitchen thing, but I think one of the cool initiatives was the healthy corners where they put fresh produce in some of these corner stores. Um, so that's an example of, it's not the end all be all, but that's an example of a partnership, a community effort. It employs people. The farmers are happy. There's moving a little bit of produce. So I think it's a collective one. What do we need to make sure everybody has access? And then two, let's use our power. Right, we vote without dollar. There's a lot of guys making millions and millions of dollars in this city through food. So let's put a little pressure on them, the food people, to say, "Hey, not do it, but what can we do? Let's have a collective conversation." So does that was that too broad of a? No, no, no. It was great. I want to talk more about that. Okay. We're gonna sit down. Yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna check out the blog and we're yeah. gonna wrap. Yeah. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.
Hi there. Uh, my name is Bisma Kasuri. I'm also a student in the hospitality program here at Georgetown. Um, and I guess keeping in line with the uh, storytelling theme, I wanted to know um, what was your most unique or memorable dining experience and maybe where it was. Unique and memorable dining experience. That's, y'all got the doozies on me today. <laughs> um, so I'll tell you the first thing, this is not dining, but it's eating. And then uh, maybe that are you works. asking like, um, that works. so a cook of mine, well, I'll tell you one and I'll tell you a restaurant thing, but a cook of mine comes to me. He didn't speak. He maybe speak, spoke mm -hmm. maybe four, uh, four uh, words in English, maybe four. He's a really good friend of mine today and one of the chefs, sous chefs at one of the best Italian restaurants in Washington, D.C. Uh, and he spoke four, he was a dishwasher, he spoke four words of English. I love him. I love him. His story is amazing. Um, he comes to me one day, he's like, through a translator, chef, you like ceviche? I'm like, I love ceviche. He's like, one day I'm going to bring you some ceviche. No problem. So next couple of days, he brings me some ceviche and a cup. He's from Guatemala. Anybody here from Guatemala? Nope. Okay. So it was in like, you know, the, the frosted sort of plastic, the Coke cups that were in the cafeteria. He brings it in that. It's got some tomatoes and the fish is sort of tan. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I ain't never had no fish like this, but I understand he really went home. This is like, it was covered in foil. I'm like, okay, it's warm too. I'm like, bro, we got to talk about food safety. This ain't Guatemala. I need my ceviche cold, you know? <laughs> But I taste it because it's, he really is, it, it means a lot to him. He's cooking from his heart. So I taste it, and it's okay, the flavor was good. And my, my guy, Noe, who was from, I forget where Noe was from, but we call him Sonrisas, which means smiley. And he always smiling, but he's over in the corner, like going to town on it and dying laughing, right? So all the Spanish guys, there's something going on. And, I, and I'm like, what's up, Noe, what's up? What you, what you doing, y'all set me up? And he's like, um, and he starts gesturing toward a, toward a, towards his, he's like, mm, mm, you know, and, uh, and, and Marvin, who's the one that doesn't speak English, he's like, yeah, the, mm, the toro, the toro. And I'm like, well, what, 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 the toro, and Sonrisas is laughing. He's like, yeah, yeah, the toro. I'm thinking ceviche increases virility, makes you like a bull, you know, one of those crude kitchen things. Okay, I get it, yeah. And Marvin's like, no, 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 the toro. So I'm like, somebody translate. And it was like, chef, you're eating uh, bull's testicles. Yeah. <laughs> so um, that was the last. I was like, okay, we're going we gonna to shelve this. We're going to put that. Um, so that was really, really unique. The best, <laughs> but most bizarre food I've ever had. Um, uh, and I never had it again. The, the, one of the best dining experiences I've ever had that changed my mind about dining was true in Chicago. Uh, Rick Tremonto and Gail Gand were executive chef, pastry chef, and this was, uh, it was a common threads dinner. It was about, it was like 14 courses, and the chefs were showing off, right? When chefs get around, we show off, right? We show off because we know, I, I, first of all, you're checking me out, but there was like 14 courses, the grand tasting. There was a fork for your fork, and there was a purse for, when we came up, there was a stool at every it was like three stools. And I didn't know, you know, I'm from, you know, I, I hadn't lived in the hood for a minute, but I didn't know if I was supposed to tie my shoe on this thing or, you know, I'm like, what's that for? I didn't say anything, but there was only like three of them. There were three ladies at the table though. Had a chair for your purse. I said, oh, you all, this is, oh, we getting in some dining right here. You got a chair for your purse. I said, that's heavy right there. You know, that's just a small thing, a small detail. So anyway. It was magical. The dining experience was magical. It was exhaustion. I mean, it's a three, four hour dinner. At the end, you're like, it was a lot of food, um, but it was the, I've, I since have not had anything. I mean, once dessert started, it was another four courses of dessert. It was the best meal in a, in a fine dining setting I've ever had. Rick Tremonto is a pure genius. So long answer. Awesome. No yeah. problem. Right. Perfect. Thank, Thank you so much. I know you have a few notes for us um, at uh, kind of from what you've been looking at um, yes. in, in, in your study area. So if you could uh, take us down that road while you're doing that, we're going to also um, set up. You, you shared a, a video with us as well. So we're going to set that up. But why don't you go into your um, to your uh, to your notes and take us down that path? Yes. Yeah, so not to change the 
sort of the topic. Um, but I, I, I think, um, you know, I had a, I don't say a fight, a friend, a chef friend of mine, she's from Peru. And we had a discussion when I started this whole fried chicken appropriation thing. She's like, well, you're not the only one that can cook fried chicken, Rock. You're being ridiculous. And I'm like, you don't get it. And anyway, so I explained to her, and she still doesn't get it. She's still mad at me, but whatever. Um, so I, I pulled a quote from um, Tony Tipton Martin. Tony Tipton Martin was the author I mentioned earlier, and she was on a panel at the Smithsonian as well. And this uh, is what we're going to see is another panel, which I think is it really helps show the different perspectives. But I wanted to share this one. Appreciation is wonderful. Respect and giving credit where credit is, are, is due are important. She said she calls those things, I call those things culinary rep, uh, reparations in my work. So a lot of people got uncomfortable at that point in the video. Um, <laughs> but the looming larger question for me in representing a culture that has lost a lot of its ownership over its cuisine or its cookery is that monetization is the real key here. And for us, if we can educate the broader uh, communities that our food is valuable beyond the perceptions of slumming or, you know, it has to be a barbecue shack or, you know, just that we haven't allowed classically trained African-American chefs in fine dining settings to talk about fusion food when fusion food is what we started America with. So to reorient ourselves so that monetization is possible and that there will be those who will invent restaurants, invest in restaurants that don't stand in this narrow representation is for me the next step of how we deal with appropriation. It is important for us to have these conversations and to respect the creators of the dish, but we also have to share some of that economic wealth with the very communities that you are representing. So her words, not mine. I just thought it was, she's way smarter than me. That's it. Sounds good. Well, let's go ahead and... Uh, Can I set this up real quick before absolutely. you push play? So what you're going to see you is, again, Smithsonian, if you've never been to the Food History Week, I believe around October, uh, the American History Museum. Uh, great week. You got to go. A uh, great museum, but um, they do stuff every year. This is similar to uh, th today. It's storytelling through food. So... Which I forget this gentleman's name, I'm so sorry. But this is Joan Nathan, uh, who is a, she's not a chef, but she's a Jewish food historian, like gobs of knowledge. And this is Jessica B. Harris, who I've already talked about. So two uh, scholars on the stage. And this guy's a scholar as well. I'm sorry, dude, whatever your name is. Um, <laughs> really, really smart guy. So the question uh, is a question about appropriation comes from the audience. But they were talking about, she said, uh, not Chebujan, I forget what her dish was, and hers ended up being uh, jambalaya. So they talked about the origins of it and then how it got to America in the ways that we know it now. But this is the end, the Q&A, and there's a question about cultural appropriation. Uh, we have one that just came in from the audience that really piqued my interest. And this actually comes from a chef who was thinking about the elasticity of recipes like jambalaya, for example, and bringing in the conversation of appropriation, a very hot topic in the chef community world today, how can a chef or a cook or a home cook interpret uh, dishes in a responsible way and riff on them and, and you know, add fusions? How can they do this in a responsible way, keeping in mind issues of appropriation? Well, do you mean that they're taking the, they're writing about that recipe or saying it's their own recipe? I, mean, I cannot speak for the chef in the audience who asked this, but I think it's the idea that there's a demand from American audiences today for, for new foods, for fusion foods, for revisiting traditional foods. And so chefs attempt to bring that into their restaurants to, to meet that demand. But how do they do so in a way that's not necessarily an ancestral heritage? How do they do that responsibly? I, I think that they are inappropriate. That's just the way it goes, unfortunately, today. It's not nice. It would be nice for them to um, acknowledge who they got the recipe from. Um, you can only, if the change is two ingredients or two, like a, a teaspoon versus a half a teaspoon, um, and it's yours. So there's no copyright that you can really get from that. 
But I always feel, you know, if, you, if you've done a recipe that's a good recipe, it's something that's come before and it will live after you. And that's part of the game. I think the worry you can have with, with a beer from Barbarian, and I understand why it's an important issue, is, is getting to that point where you go, only people from a culture can cook food from that culture. And I think that's a very dangerous place well, to get into. It's a slippery slope indeed. In a museum where we're talking about Julia Child's kitchen. And you know, we, and we, had, we uh, had a great conversation to the African American. <coughs> I got interested there where people say, well, they're classically trained. And they go, no, they're just trained. Classically trained means something to me. It means they're forced into necessarily a pigeonhole French. To me, I would say, no, they're trained, they're good, they're skillful, they can go off in lots of different directions. And I personally don't think it has anything to do with an accident of birth. It has to do with exposure to the cuisine, it has to do with talent. It has to do with mentorship. It has to do with being any good. I give the example where I got really angry with someone who wrote in a book, uh, in an article or something in LA, and they said, well, whenever I go to a sushi restaurant, I see Mexicans buying a Mexican book out. I go, well, you're an idiot. They're either good or they're not good. Right. And that's the truth of any chef. I, mean, I get angry about this. I'm getting wrong. You're either good or you're not good. But you have to show respect. Culture. You have to see how to create sources for the culture. You have to dedicate the time to expose yourself to that culture so you understand it. And we mentioned Rick Bayless earlier. Rick Bayless is a great example of someone who's done all of that and has every right to stand up as a cook of Mexican food because he's done his due diligence. And so I think we have to just be, while well, I totally understand that notion of, of respect for food, I think you have to be very, very careful about truck drawing lines that only certain people, which people are saying, can only cook food from a certain culture. And then now you think you can disagree with again. Um, a couple of things. One, there are cultures of power, and there are cultures with lack of power. It is, thank you. It is very, very difficult. It is very, very demeaning. It is very, very problematic when people from cultures of power appropriate with all due admiration cultures of people without power. When people don't have the power to manifest, to make their things right, clear, and claimed, it's sort of like everybody's grab. When there are an equal or proportionate number of restaurants considered white tablecloth restaurants, considered fancy fine dining restaurants, of the cultures, of people without power, then appropriate way. But until that time, be mindful, be respectful, and on occasion, back off. And how, how, and I totally agree with that, but <coughs> how would you know, how would you know when to? Without those, so what it's about is it's dialogue. It's dialogue. Ask somewhere. It's dialogue. Ask. And that's where mentorship comes in. Ask, ask somebody. <laughs> well, you know, what, what you're saying, I think of all these restaurants in Washington where um, you non powerful populations are doing, making the, um, all of the timber food. They're making the tortillas. They're making the, whatever, the breads, um, you know, that's one thing, but what you're saying is a little bit different. And I think that we, I think we're trying to, to respect the little people in the kitchen, in but, the restaurant. But see, you're already calling them little people. Well, you know, the ones that are not getting lots of money. And it is so yeah, much, thank you, but it's also <laughs> so, it's. Well, they're getting more money than they have. It's, a twisted, slippery slope, and to attempt to define it 
in a five minute panel. Yeah, it's not a good idea. Okay. okay. So we probably <laughs> move on. Why do we move on? <laughs> okay. 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 So I thought that was a cool look at three different perspectives. It was, first of all, can you think of who asked the question? It was me. Um, <laughs> I'm pretty excited about the response too, but if you, if you look, and I don't want to impress my views on what you just saw, I don't think anybody was wrong up there, but you just had, we're in different places. And Mrs. Nathan clearly identified, she said we, with the people in power. And, and I, you know, I noticed social circles that she, let me say, I think I know that she is of the powerful people in DC, right? And she, and she said, we are trying. They are making more money than they used to be, the little tortilla makers. And that's the mentality of, you know, like a minimum wage hike. And we're not even talking about, if you look at what Ms. Harris said, not necessarily just talking about the money, right? If you look at like Nashville hot chicken that originated in a certain culture, and now KFC's got it. Once KFC's got it, it's gone. <laughs> but it's how you pay respect. And, and, and you have to ask the question, what, what's going on here? Uh, and I think, um, I forget his name, I'm so sorry. He was, say it again? Aja, yes, thank you. Um, and he, this is a lot of chef friends ask me, what do I do? I want to cook it, but what do I do? And then ask somebody, dialogue. You look at the poke craze right now, it's just silly. I saw a blog with a Hawaiian chef, I mean, losing his mind. That's Hawaii, right? Came out of Hawaii. He was like, if you don't know about the culture, I mean, he's it's fell on deaf ears, obviously. If you don't know about the culture, don't cook it. You watch Ugly Delicious with David Chang, and he talks about his, you watch that? His, like, yeah. <laughs> he talked about, you didn't suffer through kimchi, people making fun of you. So he said, when white dudes cook my food, uh, the Korean food, his words, were, it, it pisses the shit out of me. That was his words. I understand that, David. I get that, right? Moving forward, we're not having a dialogue. There's gatekeepers that sometimes need to be bypassed, but some, you got to have a conversation with somebody. You didn't ask somebody before you thought about this? And nobody from the culture didn't think to promote along the way? You got 20 restaurants now. And nobody from the culture, nobody from the environment. I think in this city, particularly, this is a city that I know, we got to do some hard, hard, hard research or some soul searching, I should say. And that's all I got for now. Great. Yeah. Anyone else with comments or questions? Yes, please. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you gave me confirmation. A lot of questions that I also have to share with you, right? Or how we look at this culture, right? Why are we not succeeding like they think we should? Can you oh, they can't. You might want to, yeah, just. I'm sorry. <laughs> So um, I have these conversations also with the chef, especially around the city, right? Why we're not moving. Um, and what I've seen just doing this now is working together, having the conversations, right? No one wants to have a conversation. Um, but it lets me know, just sitting here listening to you, let me know I'm on the right path because I want to have the conversations. And I'm going to continue to try to have the conversations because we can't move forward without the conversations. Um, just culturally, I, I reached out to, when I want to get involved in something, I reach out to someone in that culture. For instance, I've been studying the Geechee culture, right? Mm -hmm. Trying to just understand it. I've never lived there, but I think it's important because part of, I feel like it's part of our culture. Um, but I, I'm not going to try to do it on my own. I'm going to try to research and have the conversations. Where did it come from? Talking to someone who lived it, who told me straight up, you know, you guys up there in soul food, macaroni and cheese has nothing to do with your culture, right? He said, okra, right? It blew my mind because I hate okra. But <laughs> it had dawned on me, my grandmother. That's all she ate, 
right? Because she's from the Carolinas. That's what it is. So I learned about the salt lands and where we came from, from the Africa to the Caribbean, to the salt lands and stuff. And now I want to talk about it because I'm excited about it. Like, he's telling me how we're losing it because no one wants to talk about it, right? They just, uh, they go down now, uh, what is it, Hilton Head now? Mm-hmm. Used to be one of the, now it's, it's touristy, right? It's one of the hottest tourist spots, but that's part of your culture. It's gone now, mm-hmm. right? Because no one's down there talking about it anymore. So I want to keep it going so it doesn't die out. So um, I was excited when Jerome did what he did at the African American. I sit down and talk to him a lot about because I want to learn. You know, I, I think what you guys do is great. And I, I get inspired um, by watching you guys dig. And I learn from you guys. But I, I do try to create on. So I just want to say thank you. Thank you. I, I really appreciate you. Thank you. I appreciate it. Listen, first of all, thanks, thanks to you because you are, is it our first time meeting in person? Yeah. So Drake Hills, right? So I, I never met this. I still haven't shaken your hand, but this is one thing. I'm going to give you all a little glimpse into Black Sheffery real quick. <laughs> give you a little view into some of the challenges that we face even within this culture in, 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 in like something like fried chicken. But for you, um, you support like so much. You repost and retweet. I'm like, who is this dude? You know, he's always supporting and encouraging uh, African-American chefs, I think in particular, but in and around DC to support one another. And quite frankly, we don't have that camaraderie that uh, other chef circles do. Um, and I think there, there are a number of reasons why we don't, but I just want to say thank you. Thanks for being here and putting it up on your Instagram. It really means a lot to me. But the glimpse, the window, part of we, this is African-Americans in general, but I'll just say in black chefs, what we do, like the guy um, from June Baby, Eduardo Jordan, up in uh, Seattle, I want to say, we are told that your food is, I already said that, your food is not, not going to make it high level with your food. So what you do is you disassociate yourself from your, your very heritage. You disassociate yourself from your culture. I don't want to be known as, so many black chefs say this, I don't want to be known as the guy that cooks fried chicken. When you get comfortable with yourself, you just, I don't really care. But so many of us, want to, and it's okay that we can cook other things. That's n- nobody's saying you, you have to cook fried chicken. Nobody's saying that. Like, that's ridiculous to say you have to. All Korean chefs don't want to cook Korean food, uh, but they don't disassociate themselves from the grandmama, right? There's a difference there. There's a distinction. Uh, in our circles, you know, I think it's a little bit to do with the hip-hop generate, like, we're competitive. And Robert Wiedemeyer and Roberto Donna and you know, and uh, Michelle Richard, they, well, they're competitive too. The difference is they understand the power of their community as well, right? That's, a, that's the thing that I don't know what it is. And I, you know, I don't know what it is, but it's tough because we, so I came up in hip hop and, you know, you want to, you know, Diddy and Jay-Z, they, they like each other, but they still want to beat each other. Um, but it's ingrained somehow in our, in our business and in us, uh, but the, the disassociation of our history and our culture and separation from it is a challenge. So I say all that to say uh, that's something that we need to work on. It's, there's sort of a lot of moving pieces in this whole conversation, but that's something that we need to work on. But it starts with people like you um, that are in uh, and support, um, you know, the community. Uh, I, you know, I, I really appreciate it. And my, my fellow Jay Wu were back there and uh, my old co So, you know, there's a lot of love in the building, but thank you so much. But it, it starts with us um, own, owning who we are, you know, and then going forward. So thanks for being here. Appreciate it. Um, and uh, there's a, a museum being built right now in Charleston, uh, uh, an African-American history museum, and they're going to have a permanent exhibit just dedicated to rice. Everything, just just the entire cultural, socioeconomic, historical, but permanent exhibition will be on, on simply on rice. So um, that should, I mean, I know they're building now, I think somewhere at the end of 2019, maybe 2020, early 2020. So it'll definitely be something to, to check to check out. Um, as we as we kind of come to a close, um, you know, I kind of want to ask a couple questions, but you know, where do we go from here at this point? You know, where do we go? Um, with our with this kind of next steps and discussions, uh, the industry has changed, and we're having these conversations. So many things are going on right now within culinary and within restaurant industry. Where do you, where, where do we go? I think that it's important to, um, you know, as we talk about storytelling, mm-hmm. all of the story is some of the story is ugly, and 
when we get into safe spaces and we provide safe spaces where people can feel comfortable telling the ugly part of the story, um, I think that's a start that, you know, we want to ask the questions and we want to know, you know, where we came from. Just in general, we want to know how this got to us, but you know, we're all storytellers if we're chefs in this industry. Uh, but I think we just need to be able to have these open and honest conversations. When I say open and honest conversations, it always need a theater, mm -hmm. but it's daily in our restaurants, in our lives, uh, just paying homage, you know. Uh, but I think that starts with, you know, somebody tells you something, you might not like it, but you don't have to necessarily always attack them, right? And these, you need to have a safe environment. So we have to ask the questions and be prepared for the answer, that the answer is not gonna always be pretty. And then uh, we can move forward. And that's the beautiful thing about America. I mean, God knows. That's the beautiful thing about America. It's not all beautiful. As a matter of fact, it's so much ugly stuff behind us. But when we're honest about it, and we, you know, we, we mash up, when we do this melting pot thing we're great at, better than anybody else, like, look what we do together. Mm -hmm. So as an industry, we got to do that as well. And you're not prepared for this question, but I uh -oh. want to ask you your perspective. What's the difference between, or do you think there's a difference, I believe what there is, between a food city and a restaurant city? And can one city be both? So for example, I mean, some would say that New Orleans is a food city, um, but it can in some aspects also be a restaurant city. There are some cities that are like Las Vegas, which might be more of a restaurant city and not a food city where there's a level of history that really goes into a food city. How, how would you define the difference? And where do you put DC? Wow. Well, I think you answered the question. Um, that you, those are two great examples. Uh, you know, Las, Las Vegas is definitely not a food city. Mm -hmm. You know, when I was working out there, I'm like, where the hell these scallops come from? We in the desert. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, all meat and potatoes out there. Um, and, 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 and New Orleans is a great um, example of a food city rich in, in cultural uh, history and culinary history and not necessarily, especially after Katrina, a, a restaurant city. So Manhattan or New York, I should say, I said Manhattan. New York is probably a little bit of both because it's surrounded by uh, so much. Uh, where's D.C.? I think D.C. <sighs> We're definitely a restaurant city. I think we're, you know, this is the thing about D.C. We're underrated as far as, our, we, you know, we're a transient city, so much of us, and we've changed over the last 10, 15 years, like, so much, our demographics. Mm -hmm. But people forget, you know, New, like, Northerners say, y'all a country, y'all Southern. Southerners say, y'all a city, like, y'all not, well, he's stuck in the middle. Mm -hmm. But we are, we, we just, we're surrounded by so much, and it's all accessible to us but we sort of sit in a very weird place. So I think we're both. Mm -hmm. I mean, DC is, I don't know how, how long you all been in DC, but I've been in DC all my life Well, in Alex, from Alexandria. 20 years ago when I started, like, it was like five chefs. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like that, and they weren't doing super, ex I mean, they were doing super excited food, but now, you know, you got these, I mean, you got pop-up bars that'll serve you know, like these Kool-Aid things at 1 a.m. and the chicken biscuit after you smoke hookah with a, with a shaman <laughs> or something. I mean, this is a cool city. Right. You know, right. it's a real cool city. Right. Uh, so, yeah, I think we're a little bit of both. And we're close. We're close to all of that. Virginia, Maryland, uh, Pennsylvania, all of that. Very nice. So. Please. So I just have a quick question um, about when you were talking about um, the interaction that you have with other chefs. Um, I just wanted to know from your perspective of how you can garner support from your community, the customers, um, your following base um, to support you in your efforts as a chef. Um, most recently, we went to a black owned restaurant in the area and the gentleman, the chef actually came out um, to um, the, the patrons and asked for feedback. And I just wanted to know, um, and we were very honest, um, and we had a wonderful dining experience, but I just wonder how can we help to increase, you know, a black chef's following and support you? Because um, I think that, as you were saying before, together we can be dynamic. But um, 
what, what's just some of your feedback to a person that would like to some more support more? Thank you. That's a, that's a great question. And I, I think that, you know, it's, so what we can do as chefs and what, what you can do as customers, um, you know, social media is, is excellent. Just retweeting or liking or, you know, it, I grew up, my mother, it was, ve- it was okay when I grew growing up to say support black businesses. And now it's like, if you say that, it's like, oh, are you being kind of racist? It's like, what? What are you talking about? Like, I got an Italian friend who will not buy certain products unless it comes from Italian, you know, and, and a couple of my Jewish friends as well, right? Like, no, like I'm not shopping over there. I get it. Okay, that's cool. We shop here, right? We understand the power of that. So what you can do is through social media, through word of mouth, it's just, you know, support us with your dollars, right? Um, make sure that's in your regular, you know, we don't want to be limited in our experiences, especially in this food boom that I'm talking about. We don't want to only buy black, but support us. And um, I think honesty is really important. One, as chefs, we get black to black communications a little different, right? We get, people get all in their feelings. I don't know what it is. It's just like, you know, I don't want to support. We got all sorts of issues, right? But one, as a chef, I need to be able to go out to the table and ask you. It was a woman, was it all women? At the table? Um, Yes. So Uh, that to some can be intimidating Mm -hmm. and touch a few chords, right? But you got to get over that as a chef. Exactly. So we have to ask for it and be objective about the feedback. We don't have to agree with it, but we have to ask for it and then do what you just did. This communication, what can you do? So asking that of the uh, merchants or or the store owners or whatever, Asking that, what you just did, I think is the, is the best way. I might not like it. As an artist, see, I'm an artist and a businessman. And as an artist, it's great. I don't want to hear it. That's going on up here. You know what I'm saying? Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it. That's going on out there. Yeah. Right? And then when I get back and I sit and I talk to some of my colleagues and I, I can be objective and be the businessman and take the emotion out of it, I can say, well, you know what? Maybe the greens were a little too salty today. Or maybe we did take a little long or maybe she does have a point with the macaroni and cheese. Mm-hmm. So having a conversation I think is important. Um, and then just simply supporting it because, uh, because you like it and telling a business that, you know, where they fail at. If you think it's too expensive or uh, whatever it is, whatever the criticism is, I think it's really important to communicate that in a very healthy way because we don't know. Then we know when we can't pay the rent and we got to go, right? So thanks for doing that. Definitely. And I, so I have a second question as Please. well, if we have a few minutes. I'll make my answer. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so actually, I'm from Nashville. So for you to bring up the Nashville hot chicken, I was very excited because <laughs> I have my views on it. But um, I just, when you were talking about the food city versus a restaurant city, I wonder how do you view cities when they have a staple item that identifies that city? So for instance, Memphis barbecue, Kansas City barbecue, Nashville, now this hot chicken. So I'm, I'm just curious your perspective and how that relates back to DC. It, it doesn't have like this particular key identity. So <coughs> does that affect its, um, not ranking, but you know what I mean in the sense of where do we really where does DC fit in all of this? Let's just say. Well, we got, yeah. we got, we got. Oh, mumbo sauce. <laughs> See, yeah. we got mumbo sauce. But well, it's we, a sauce versus a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mumbo sauce, I forgot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we have mumbo sauce and we yeah, have Ben's, Ben's chili bowl. Yeah. yeah. Which, yeah. Which, which are not yes. glamorous. Yeah, 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 yeah. And a lot of people, yeah. no, that can't define me. Yeah. Um, so I think Ben's chili bowl and mumbo sauce <laughs> represent, forget the food for a moment, even if, like, because DC people tell you, chili ain't that good, chili ain't that good. I don't know what the fuss is about, right? I don't know why people line up in that. Right? Natives always tell you that, chili ain't that good. <laughs> it's like, okay, 3,000 people just walked through that line. Something's going on. It's the idea of what they represent. Yes. So the Ali family, what they represent, just on any level, what they've done exactly. is mind-blowing. What, how Mumbo Sauce was created, and its iterations, and even Chicago trying to lay claim to it, is mind-blowing. So what you'll find is that in these areas, Memphis, 
um, all these areas, people don't want to be defined. It's that sort of that kid. You don't really want to, you're not going to define me. Chess, we don't want to be boxed in. So you're not going to define me. Even if you, unless you come from like, I would imagine if you came from like an elite place, like when you were, you know, uh, somewhere in France and everything surrounded around your cuisine, you're still going to push back as a, as a young budding artist. I want to step outside of that box. So I think that the chili bowl, the half smoke and the mumbo sauce, what happened about 10 years ago, because food writers are, here people started to say like that ain't gonna define me right yeah. because they were asking a question you guys got the half smoke you guys got the half smoke so what what you do is you say oh no we're gonna do something else right so you push even harder to break break that mold and Ben's chili bowl will always be iconic here so you can't go away from that exactly. so so i i think it's i think it's cool because no matter where you are you're gonna you're gonna find people that push even in the Memphis, in the barbecue scene even if they stay within that space they push the limits they def they redefine what barbecue is now, um, so I, I like it. It, it, it pushes and it, and it gives us an identity. Definitely. Yeah, thank you. We got to talk later about what you think about Nashville hot chicken. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I would just like to to end on a note that's your words, right? So a uh, thing forty, and I'm just gonna handle just uh, give you a little excerpt. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Many people don't believe that they can change the world and they don't realize that they already are doing so. Through action or inaction, the world is changed every day by what we do or what we don't do. When it comes to cooking, healthy for your kids in this case, I encourage you to go even further and make looking for new ideas a regular occurrence in your circle of friends. Start a group that will change the world. Okay, maybe the world is a little ambitious. So in the meantime, start with changing your world. Tell your friends and family about your desire to cook healthy, to have continued discussion, to bounce some ideas off of them. Meet on a regular basis. Start off small, unless you can handle an overwhelming amount of suggestions, feedbacks, and complaints. I always suggest starting off nice and slow. Don't try to jump in and overwhelm, overwhelm yourself. Invite two people or couples and start from there. Too many people in your healthy cooking summit, continued conversation or cultural appropriation will force you to never do it again after experiencing a bit of confusion. Okay, now what? Once you have your new crew assembled, you just share ideas and experiences about healthy cooking or continuing this dialogue. You may be surprised to find that you aren't the only one with the craziest eaters in the world or the craziest ideas. Add that part. You will also be surprised at how many suggestions people have for you and also how you can help change another's life. It's all about having dialogue. Speaking on social networking sites, use those also. If you don't have anyone in your area, try connecting with the internet to friends or family. Actually, I think it would be awesome to meet strangers and discuss solutions to your challenges of eating healthy or having difficult discussions. A fresh perspective is the most awesome thing ever. I live in Virginia and the wonderful people of Oregon have products and techniques for eating healthy that I would, never, uh, that I would have never thought of before speaking with them. Your summit could be easy as an email with four questions on it that goes out when you begin. Hold discussions on Facebook, on Skype, by snail mail, or but, but by any means, just answer others' questions based on your experiences and watch the change in your world. Those are your words. My name is Erin Tucker. I'm the faculty director here at uh, Georgetown University School of Continuing Studies, Global Hospitality Leadership Program. And all of us, thank you so much for taking the time to come and visit us today, come and speak to us, and we thank you. Thank you. We have a reception that is right up the stairs, so you can continue this conversation. Um, and uh, please join us for the reception upstairs. Thank you, everyone, for Thank coming. You.